In the late 19th century, China was very close to becoming the new Africa. Germany began the scramble for China by claiming parts of Shandong, and then most of the other powers got involved. Even the Italians looked to get a peace and sent ships to threaten the Chinese into handing over land. So China as we know it today might not have existed, but it was saved largely thanks to one American. Now this scramble for China did not occur just after the Opium Wars. For the most part, like elsewhere in the world, the major powers were satisfied with trading rights. In fact, the British, French and Americans had every opportunity to divide China up between them, or at least establish puppets, but for the most part they didn't. You only need to look at China in the middle of the 19th century to see how weak it was at the time. For instance, there was the Taiping Rebellion, one of the bloodiest wars in human history, started when a man claimed he was the brother of Jesus. There was the Nyan Rebellion in the north, which was mainly started by bandits. The secret society, Tian Di Hui, sought to bring back the old Ming Dynasty, and they started the Red Turban Rebellion in Guangdong. Plus, a group linked with them, the Small Sword Society, took Shanghai in 1851. Muslims rose up in the Panthai Rebellion around Yunnan, and there was another Muslim rebellion out in the far west, the Dungan Revolt. There were also some ethnic rebellions, like when the Zhuang took over parts of Guangxi, and the Miao took over parts of Guizhou. During all of this, the Nepalese invaded Tibet in 1855, but this resulted in a stalemate, and this is when the Second Opium War erupted. During this, the British, French and Americans got involved, and as you can see, they had any number of allies they could have picked from. For instance, maybe they could have chosen the Christian Taiping, but they didn't. They signed further trade deals and only expanded Hong Kong a little bit. Then, as soon as the conflict was over, they helped train up the Chinese forces to defeat the rebels, and General Gordon and his ever-victorious army was pretty instrumental in this. The Western nations then sent advisors to help in the construction of modern ports and the like. In fact, one of the only nations to seize a chunk of territory during this period was the Russians. During the Second Opium War, they threatened to open up a war on a second front, and were able to force the Chinese to cede half of Manchuria and parts of the West to them. Now I want to emphasise this here because sometimes it seems that a lot of people believe that the Western colonial powers were after as much land as humanly possible, but this wasn't always the case. In fact, many of the leaders in these nations spoke against acquiring colonies as expensive or useless. Palmerston and Britain, for instance, often spoke against it, and so too did Bismarck of Germany. Elsewhere, the British, for instance, stopped the Ottoman Empire from being dismantled and didn't rush for colonies or partitions. So the scramble for Africa was a bit of an outlier, as most of the colonial powers were previously content with taking small trading colonies, but then Belgium, Italy and Germany all entered the continent, and this panicked the powers who had been there for centuries. Now this isn't to say that the British, French and the likes were acting nobly, they of course took resources from the countries they traded with, but in terms of China, they hoped that it could become a strong ally against their chief enemy at the time, Russia. Or they could have also helped against the French in Southeast Asia, after all the Chinese performed quite well during the Sino-French War. Plus, a stable China with a modernising army would be a good trading partner to sell their mass-produced goods to. So again, it's not like the British and French weren't acting in their own interests. Anyway, a similar panic occurred in China, and it was started by Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm broke from Bismarck's policy of focusing on Europe, which was known as Realpolitik, and he wanted to start seeking colonies abroad with his policy of Weltpolitik. Plus, the Kaiser also had a great fear of Asia. He often looked to unite the West against the rising power of the Asian states, as seen in the image, Peoples of Europe, guard your most sacred possessions. This was allegedly based on a sketch of his, and shows European powers looking in horror at the power of Asia, represented by a Buddha on fire. Plus, the Kaiser is often credited with coining the term Yellow Peril. Germany nevertheless continued to train the Chinese military, like many other Europeans did, and equipped them with two large battleships. There were still Germans advising the Japanese, like Jacob Meckel, and there were other Europeans on both sides, but for most observing, a Chinese victory against Japan was assured. This obviously wasn't the case during the First Sino-Japanese War, as their disorganised navy was crushed and Japan took Taiwan, freed Korea from Chinese influence, and the Japanese were also set to take Port Arthur. Well, the Russians wanted that for themselves. The French backed their Russian ally, and Wilhelm sought to undermine the growth of a major Asian power. So the Triple Intervention of 1895 humiliated Japan as they forced them to surrender Port Arthur, and this was especially embarrassing 
as the Japanese watched what happened next. In 1897 in Shandong, German missionaries were killed in the Ju Yi incident. The Germans had had their eyes on Shandong for a while, and just a year earlier, Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz had toured the area and declared that it would be a good location for a future naval base. But for a couple of years, the Germans were eyeing up other locations, like Joshan Island, or they even thought about sharing Taiwan with Japan. But just before the Ju Yi incident, Otto von Dietrichs became the leader of the East Asian fleet and he saw the potential to exploit it. In fact, he even asked the Admiralty in Germany, may incidents be exploited in pursuit of further goals? Although the Admiralty had some hesitation, the Kaiser jumped at the chance and pushed him to sail to the area and demand concessions. Diedrich, in fact, would later go on to try and exploit the American-Spanish War, and he sent a fleet to the Philippines, believing he could get Germany a seat at the peace table and secure a port or at least a chunk of the Philippines. So this was not a one-off for him. While well, the German warships arrived in November 1897, troops landed and they took Kiaochow Bay. The Germans then forced the Chinese to lease this port for 99 years, similar to British Hong Kong, but essentially, German influence spread out from beyond this port. Then, as Wilhelm declared, hundreds of German merchants will rejoice at the realisation that the German Empire has at last won a firm footing in Asia. Hundreds of thousands of Chinamen will tremble when they fear the iron fist of the German Empire heavy on their necks and the whole of the German people will be glad that their government has done a manly act. They were then granted the right to construct railway lines in Shandong and mine coal in the area. Plus, to defend their new investments, they were allowed to deploy troops. Prince Heinrich of Prussia, for instance, said that the trains would spread German culture and German conscientious devotion to duty. This, however, subsequently panicked the other powers, while some began to see an opportunity to seek out colonies for themselves. Initially, the Russians were angry with the Germans, seeing this whole region as under their sphere of influence, and even threatened to intervene. But instead, they decided to immediately force the Chinese to hand over Port Arthur in March 1898. They then set to work on building a train line connecting it to the Trans-Siberian Line, and troops were sent in to guard the construction. Further troops would be sent into Manchuria, and this would later result in the Russo-Japanese War a few years later. Wilhelm was happy that the Russians had gained a sphere of influence in Manchuria, saying that the two European nations were a good pair of sentinels, who will be duly respected, especially by the Yellow Ones. And he declared that the Russians were, morally speaking, the master of Peking. Now you may be asking why did the Chinese just hand over Port Arthur to the Russians? Well, that's thanks to the Li Lobanov Treaty. This secret treaty allowed China to loan money from the Russians, enough to pay the war indemnities owed to the Japanese, but in return, they gave the Russians the right to build railway lines and open Russian banks in China. This is essentially debt trap diplomacy. The French from their recently conquered colony of Indochina would also look to expand and they were given Guangzhou Wan in May of the same year. This wasn't necessarily an important town, but it was in a key location and could well have challenged British Hong Kong. As for the British, they grew wary of Russian and German influence in the north, so they pressured the Chinese to hand over Wei Highway and they expanded Hong Kong in the south. But Britain had hesitated. Back in January, the cabinet decided that they would not pursue any expansionist claims. Initially, Prime Minister Salisbury was content with allowing the Russians to expand in the north, while the British kept to the south. It is even said that he proposed this split to the Russians, but the Tsar passed this information on to Wilhelm and then declined the offer. Lord Charles Beresford was sent to China and in 1899, he published The Breakup of China warning the British against allowing spheres of influence to develop. But despite calls for maintaining the open-door policy, which allowed any foreigners to trade freely in China, British prestige took a hit by allowing the Russians, French and Germans to expand. So Salisbury gave in to the pressure and took a port. Yet, as he said, it will not be useful and will be expensive, but as a matter of pure sentiment, we will have to do it. And he later justified it to Parliament by saying, what China wants is courage and one of the defences of the occupation of Wei Highway is that it had a tendency to strengthen China against despair and give it courage. The danger of allowing the occupation of Port Arthur to take place without any corresponding movement on our side was that China, or large classes of Chinamen, would give up to despair. Others like Lord Curzon in India advocated for taking more, as if Russia was to take the north and France take the south, British influence should spread in the centre. So they pressured the Chinese into agreeing not to hand over any concessions to other major powers in this region. This, in theory, meant that it was in Britain's sphere of influence, 
but barely. They knew very little could be done to actually make sure China upheld their part of the agreement, and it meant very little on the ground. Individual railway contracts were still fought over by companies from all the powers, even Belgium, and international ships were still free to use the river. So it was best described at the time as a paper sphere of influence. Some of you may well have seen this map of spheres of influence in China. Well, the majority of these come from these agreements, preventing other major powers from being given a concession. Like the French demanded the same for Hainan in the south, and Japan did it in Fuzhou. The other areas like Mongolia, Xinjiang and the likes are pretty hard to actually verify. But again, at this point, we're just in the preliminary moves, and all of this happened in less than two years. And one nation does not appear on this map, the Italians. They had just been defeated by the Ethiopians but still sought an empire. So in 1899 they sent ships to China and demanded the Chinese hand over Sun Min Bay and a railway concession. But the Chinese actually stood up for themselves on this one, called the Italians bluff and denied them, forcing them to leave humiliated back to Europe. So in 1899 China looked set to be divided between all the major powers, but one man in particular changed all of this, John Hay, the Secretary of State in the United States. Many British people including Beresford had wrote to Hay and the Americans, encouraging them to defend the old open door policy in China. While Hay agreed, sent diplomatic notes to the European powers, encouraging them to uphold the policy and not break up China. And it seems that they all just agreed. Britain and Germany for instance signed the Yangtze Agreement shortly afterwards, but it should be said that by 1900 it became clear that Germany's markets in China would considerably be reduced if China was divided into spheres of influence. After all, it seems that Britain would take the centre, France the south, Russia the north, and German traders could only trade in Shandong. The Chinese, however, were of course unaware of these diplomatic notes between the major nations, and that same year the Boxer Rebellion broke out. This started in German-controlled Shandong, but quickly spread out, and the foreign legation quarters in Beijing were besieged. He feared that the powers would use this to partition China, and advocated that the Chinese government worked alongside the Westerners while maintaining communication with the Eight Nation Alliance. And to some degree he was successful. Austrians, Italians and the likes would gain small concessions in Tianjin afterwards, but by and large, the major powers agreed to uphold the agreements. That is, once again, except Russia. They used the rebellion to send further troops into Manchuria, and this is what led to the Russo-Japanese War. Plus, after the rebellion, the British and India, without authorization from London, marched into Tibet and turned it into a protectorate. However, once this expedition was over, the government almost immediately handed it back to China and withdrew their claims. Later on, of course, Manchuria would fall into Japanese hands, and Xinjiang and Mongolia would both eventually become communists and almost puppets of the USSR. However, for these two years in the late 19th century, China was very close to being partitioned. But thanks to advocates of free trade and open door policy in Britain and the United States, it wasn't. Yet for fans of alternative history, you can start creating your own colonies, like a huge French Indochina spreading over to Hainan, German North Africa, Italian China and the likes. So maybe even today China would have been divided as the Arab world is, or as many people at the time predicted, great powers could well have fought over competing claims, bringing World War I 10 years earlier, and at that point, alliances were far from secure. So potentially the allies of Britain and Japan fighting against Russia and France. Or, like in my next video, I'll be looking at another strange potential alliance between the Americans and Germans, which aim to defend the Chinese against the Japanese. So I leave you with my question today. Can you think of any other strange partition plans? One I'm hoping to make a video on soon is the medieval partition of England, but leave yours in the comments below.